Before we went on our first mission, Colonel Lay, who wrote 12 O'Clock High and I Wanted Wings and a few other uh, books, he looked at us and says, you look at that man on your right, you look at that man on your left, and when you get 30 missions, neither one of those men will be there. I was a pilot, a, a first pilot of all of, uh, I had a co-pilot that flew with me and it was uh, nine, it was eight other people, it was ten of us to a crew, and I was a pilot of uh, that crew. So we went to Hanover. Well, I was flying deputy lead, so uh, when we went over the, before we got to the target, they hit that, the lead airplane and knocked out all of the man's engines but one. And of course, he didn't get the bomb, well, the first time we went over, the bombardier didn't get his instrument set up right and we didn't drop the bombs. We had to make a second turn around and when we got there just before the bomb uh, point of release, why well, they hit that lead airplane and knocked out all three engines and killed two people in the plane. And then that left me with the lead. Well, we had to go back over uh, Hanover the third time and they had our altitude and my bombardier dropped the bombs and I lost one engine and that and we lost I think four planes all told it was shot down over the target. Well, in combat, I guess the most memorable experience I had in combat, we had gone on a mission and a plane underneath me got shot and the shell went right through the wing right close to the fuselage and it was burning like crazy. and. Uh, I had two wingmen and the lead had two wingmen and I couldn't get out of there and I had to fly that airplane within the props of my plane were on each side of his fuselage and my gunners and uh, kept screaming pull up pull up pull up and the, that fire was going about 200 feet behind that airplane and I could have reached up and touched the other airplane and finally it blew up and we got away from it and it, of course it killed everyone on that airplane. The scariest I ever was, I guess of all my flight, we had uh, the group bombardier had uh, been wounded and he'd stayed in the hospital for about two months and he wanted to go home and my CO asked me to fly co-pilot with him down to right close to London to take his clothes. When we got there, the hospital he was in was about 40 miles away, and it was just before Christmas. And it was the worst kind of day, old drizzly cold day, and the clouds was right on the ground. And we came back, and we had an old airplane that what had been over there at the start of the war, and it was outmoded, and they'd stripped it of all, everything on it. And we were flying it visually, because you could see some lights, it had gotten dark and they had a red alert and when they had that red alert all the lights in, on, in England went out and we were up there and we uh, uh, we didn't know what to do I guess is what you'd say or we knew what we had to do to something you couldn't see and you can't fly an airplane unless you have something visual or you have instruments well the CO said well what are we going to do I said I don't know he says, my, my flight instruments are not working. I said, a minute, and I, my gyro horizon happened to work, and I couldn't see it. I said, well, I can't see it. There's no lights. The engineer says, I got a cigarette lighter. He had a Zippo lighter, and he flipped that thing on, and we flew it for several minutes with a cigarette lighter, and he kept trying to call the base, and I guess the base knew we were out there somewhere. And they fired a mortar and it went up about six or eight thousand feet and gave us a horizon to fly by. Well, about the time it had a chute on it and it came down very slow, but it was extremely bright light. And about the time it got to the ground, they fired another one. And uh, <clears throat> about the time it got to the ground, we got close to our base and they turned the lights up very faintly to where we could see them. And they kept turning them down as we got closer 
and we landed that airplane with just little blue lights on each side of the runway, and when we landed, we got out of it, and that was my most scary moment. If it hadn't been a Zippo lighter, I wouldn't be here. We went to Hanover, and uh, I'll give you an account of that mission. Well, I was flying deputy lead, so uh, when we went over the, before we got to the target, they hit that, the lead airplane, and uh, and knocked out all of the man's engines but one. And of course, he didn't get the bomb. Well, the first time we went over, the bombardier didn't get his instrument set up right, and we didn't drop the bombs. We had to make a second turn around, and when we got there just before the bomb uh, point of release, why they hit that lead airplane and knocked out all three engines and killed two people in the plane, and then that left me with the lead. We had to go back over uh, Hanover the third time, and they had our altitude, and my bombardier dropped the bombs, and I lost one engine and that, and we lost, I think, four planes all told. It was shot down over the target. I didn't have any man that flew with me to ever get a scratch, even in when we crash landed. Why, uh, it was as smooth a landing as I ever made. I landed behind those houses, and they didn't even know I was out there. I went on up there and knocked on the door to find to see if they had a telephone. <laughs> was this an actual crash? Yes, ma'am. Where it, were you at this time? Well, when I lost the engines, I was halfway between England and France in the nearest part of the English Channel. And I landed at, at Dover, on the cliffs of Dover at St. Margaret's Bay, and got over the minefield about a quarter of a mile. They had it mined there, and I just barely did get over the minefield. Was there anything you did uh, for good luck? You prayed a lot. <laughs> I guess if you'd say that. Well, you'd take a lot of deep breaths, you know, whenever you'd, you'd see that flak out there and you know, you had to go right in it because when it was over the target, well, there wasn't anything you could do but just go and you couldn't take any evasive action or anything like that. You just had to take a deep breath and go on. Well, we didn't get any leave at all when we were in England. But we had four squadrons, and three of them would squ uh, fly at a time. And uh, when you were, wasn't flying, well, you were free to do whatever you want to. And occasionally, uh, they'd have maybe several days, and we could get a three- or four-day pass, and we'd go to London and celebrate. Mostly after payday, because you didn't have any more money at the end of it. Well, the English people were very friendly. They, they appreciated us being over there, and, and uh, uh, we'd ride around in the countryside. We had a bicycle, and we you couldn't get a truck or anything to go anywhere, but uh, we'd ride within 10 or 15 miles of that, and occasionally we'd go to Cambridge on an off day or Oxford or Bury St. Edmunds or something like that on a day, but after you'd been to those places, there wasn't a whole lot to see, and the food was hard to come by too, well, because it's very, very much rationed in England. We were on Kwajalein Atoll, and they told us I, I was flying with another man, and I was flying as his co-pilot at that time, and. He said, they told us, he says, y'all get your, everything up. Says, there's a plane coming in here. He told us to have everything ready for when that plane comes in. Says, it will only be here long enough to be fueled. When it came in, there was a, a, a first lieutenant and two uh, tech sergeants on the airplane. And on that airplane, it was nothing but cages of white rats. And we got into... Okinawa, I mean Saipan, about three or four o'clock in the morning, and we don't know what happened to the, 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 all of the white rats, but uh, they made it to Saipan. And then the next morning, when we were taking off, 
the uh, Nola Gay was taken off from a field uh, right next to where we were, and we were taken off at the same time that the Nola Gay was leaving. We didn't know what it had. But we kind of thought that maybe that those white rats that the Japanese were fixing to use gas, and they were going to use those for gas detectors. Then I went back to to Kwajalein and they turned me around and sent me to Guam and I stayed there about one or two days and then I went to Okinawa and I stayed there till, uh, uh, on Okinawa for about oh, a month or six weeks. When I first went to Okinawa, they told us, says, we don't have any facilities for you. Says, anything, any place you can go to is an army base Why well, you're free to go there and eat. And when we, on Okinawa, I stayed there about six weeks and it was, uh, uh, lived in the airplane or under the wing of it or whatever. <laughs> in the daytime, you couldn't stay in it because it's too hot. And in the night, why you get up in there to keep the mosquitoes away from you. And slept on the ground, had one blanket or in the airplane, just on the floor. I went into Japan four days before uh, MacArthur signed the peace accord and we went into Japan right at one of the f first few that ever went into the Japan I guess and it was just like a circus coming to town. The Japanese would run, get, we'd be on the sidewalk and they'd run out in the middle of the road and, and ones on the other side of the street would stop and look at you. I guess a great white Satan's had shown up. <laughs> But they were nice to you. You found that one or two of them that could converse with you. The only ones that could, uh, we met that, that first time we went to into, uh, Tokyo, we were in front of the main gate of the Emperor's Palace there, and there was three geisha girls came down with their costumes on, and they could speak, one or two of them could speak broken English, and we could find out a little bit, but none, none of the other Japs, you, you couldn't converse with them. When the date of war ended, I was on Kwajalein Island in the Pacific, <laughs> probably just sitting and looking at the bay there. That's all there was to do. wasn't anything there. How did you receive the news? Well, of course, you know, they, uh, uh, all of the, <clears throat> All your bases were connected to uh, uh, internet. It wasn't the internet back then. That but they were all connected to the War Department. And of course, when the war ended, while well, we knew it just as soon as anyone did. I had two Christmases on Kwajalein Island, and and I had Christmas. Kwajalein was on the other side of the International Date Line, and then. Uh, Forty-six, uh, I <clears throat> was on Kwajalein and had Christmas dinner, and I flew the next morning to Hawaii, and I had Christmas there, so I had two Christmases that summer, <laughs> I mean winter. The gunners, that, that, or my crew, of the first crew, we were very close, and if we went any place, we went as a group. and. But the second tour I had, I was only close to, I guess, my co-pilot, and I had a bombardier and a navigator, but and one one of the enlisted men. He had been in a plane that cracked up and killed several people, and when I went back, he asked me if he could be on my crew, and he wanted to go home, and he felt like he could, I could fly enough of safe missions for him to do that. William A. Jeffries. Well, I asked for a discharge and they wouldn't give me one. It took me four months to get a discharge. And I didn't fly any of during that four months waiting for them to figure out how, if they could keep me or if I was going to get out. So I told my daddy, I said, you go see Dr. Connor and get him to say I'm needed at home to look after you. He's in good health. And he did and they gave me a hardship discharge. Well, for uh, an air medal, you got one for every five missions. And uh, for an air uh, DFC, you had to have 25 or 30 missions. 
and I got uh, two of those. And then I got a silver star for landing the airplane at uh, St. Margaret's Bay. With that, They gave me a silver star for that. Well, liberty means a whole lot. It means the freedom that you have in this country that you don't have in other countries and the opportunities that are out there for young people and, and the, uh, the benefits that you get from being a citizen of the United States. There are other good countries too, but the majority of the countries in the world are way, way behind us, especially South America and Africa. We had a guy that when we went overseas, it looked after our tent. We stayed in, in Fortaleza, Brazil. We stayed there about a week or 10 days, and we paid him a nickel a day. And he thought he had the best job in the world, and they wouldn't allow you to pay him anymore either. That was it. He shined our shoes. He made our beds. He washed what little clothes we had. He did everything for us, and he made five cents a day for all of us, 10 of us. And Africa it was just a disaster. Well, we went into Belém, and uh, 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 and we flew into Dakar. Belém was in South America. We flew into Dakar, and the streets in there were dirt. They wasn't a paved thing. They had a a well up and down the street every now and then, and you got your water out of that well. And they had an old rusty bucket tied with a piece of wire. And there was no, the old shacks was made out of driftwood and old rusty tin and stuff like that. It was pathetic. And if those people, if they wanted to go anywhere, they ran. And then we left there and flew across the Sahara there to Marrakesh. And in Marrakesh, it was a little bit more, it was a French army base at one time. And it was a little bit more advanced. But you would see everything of, of moving there. You saw elephants. You saw camels. You saw people pushing carts and pulling them. Uh, and, uh, and those uh, Arabs, they, the old buses there, they, they had some buses that would go through the countryside. And they fired them with charcoal. Had some kind of a boiler on the back of it. And you bought two tickets if you wanted to ride the bus. You bought one for the inside and one for the top side. And those Arabic people would get on with that old woolen, look like a, 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 a dress, and come down to the ankles. And they'd sit on that bus and they'd ride all day on the bus, going wherever they was going to, sitting up there on top of it. They'd just squat down, you know, and they'd be hanging out the windows and everything else. Uh, we could rent a, a horse to ride there. The Sultan uh, had some fine horses, and occasionally we could we could let it, he'd let us ride them, but he wouldn't let the other people from up there ride them. This country is just like other countries. If we didn't have a military, we wouldn't have this country. And it, it, a country, a military, uh, an army, uh, is to protect the people in that country. Some nations do it a whole lot better than others. And of course, you know, some of these dictators and rulers, they exploit the army. Well, anyone that's been in war, is, uh, they'll all tell you, I guess I might not use this word, but war is hell. It's nothing good about war in any country, anywhere, when human lives are being lost. That's my, what I think of war. They, I, they should never occur, but they do. But they're disastrous to the victor plus and very disastrous to the loser.